Whenever I talk to engineers about their ideas for sending spacecraft to Alpha Centauri with lasers, I always like ask about, I mean, this, how can we use this technology here in the solar system? It's like perfect to explore tons of other worlds. And finally, I got somebody who is actually planning just that. Uh, his name is Alexander Alvera. He's working with a team of engineers at the University of California, Berkeley on the Bliss mission. And this is an interplanetary exploration with swarms of low cost spacecraft. And their plan is to launch tiny little solar sails, well, like two meters across with a small instrument package to thousands of targets within the solar system. Imagine if you could study thousands of asteroids simultaneously. Imagine if you could retrieve samples from tons of different comets all at the same time, all with each spacecraft costing like about $1,000. It's a really cool idea. And I had a chance to talk with Alexander about this. All right, here's the interview. Alexander, finally, somebody is thinking about these tiny little solar sails and not trying to send them to Alpha Centauri, but keeping them in the solar system. I'm really yeah. excited to talk to you. So, so give me a sense of, of what, you know, your proposal, what are, what are your plans? What are you hoping to do? Sure. Um, just really high level. Uh, basically, we want to make uh, mil not millions, thousands of, of really small. Eventually uh, millions. Eventually, one day. Yeah. Uh, thousands of really small uh, solar sail propelled spacecraft that are composed of mostly components from off the shelf and uh, use them for not only for asteroid inspection, but for comet chasing and hopefully wow. to bring back some material from comets. So give me a sense of the scale of just one of these spacecraft. Sure. Um, so you can think about your windshield maybe and think about how wide that is. Maybe cut that a little bit, and extend it a little bit. And that's about what you're thinking about for, for the solar sail itself. That's a really thin piece of mylar it's a, or, or cap, uh, CP1. It's another material that we're thinking about using. Um, and it's really thin. And you can deposit a really nice sheen of uh, luminized uh, a metal surface to make it really reflective. And then you attach that by carbon fibers, which are really thin, but really strong to these uh, components from off the shelf kind of that we put together, attach them to the, to the MEMS parts, which is kind of the focus of what I'm doing. And uh, that, that itself is about this big. So you're talking about something that's 10 grams, uh, really light. And, and so, you know, the solar sail, I mean, we've seen a couple of solar sails in space. Uh, there was a Japanese solar sail. There was, of course, the Planetary Society's Light Sail 2. Unfortunately, a NASA NIA scout failed. So we didn't get a chance to see how that operated. But um, do, do, does, do these materials to make a solar sail that is that strong and that size, is that a problem? Or is that like off the shelf, as you say? No, not nowadays. Uh, one of the cool things about the, the advancement of the, the smartphone race, as it were, is that uh, you end up with these really thin, really small components that are just the right size for everything that we need. Um, you slap that together with the, the new uh, carbon fiber uh, manufacturing industry and uh, the advances in thin film uh, 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 illuminization and you basically have the majority of what we need. Hmm. So then, so you, so that's one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. give me a sense of like, how would you plan to deploy them? Would you launch, you said thousands, you know, and we dreamt yeah. about maybe millions, but thousands, are you sort of deploying them all at once to different destinations, same destination? What, what's the plan? Well, there's a, a few iterations before that, but let's talk about the dream. Um, if you wanted to, just deploy them. What you would do is you'd pick, let's say that we're, we're imagining one per comet or one per asteroid. You pick a thousand asteroids that, or a thousand comets and you go out and you have each one deployed out in uh, geosynchronous orbit or a little further out if you can get the, the money to kind of ship it that far. And then uh, afterwards, what you have is these these lost in space type, type protocols, which is just image recognition of the stars. And um, they can go out and, and potentially grab material, these really, really fine uh, uh, 
bite-sized amounts of material from the plumes of the comets. Um, it's really pristine. And so that's that would be like the ideal. And if one manages to make it, so we're talking about one, a 1% success rate, uh, that'll still be the second piece of, of a comet plume that we ever brought. And hopefully uh, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to fly by it nice and smooth like not not super fast or anything so that way when we come into contact with this really fine particulate it doesn't like vaporize and or it doesn't um, bounce off our sail uh, so that's the hope if we get something like 300 micrograms that'll be on on scale with the uh, wild 2 comet that was visited um, by the the um, Stardust, the Stardust mission yeah yeah. And I believe there was something like on, on the order of a thousand studies done on just that little mm. 300 micrograms of, of material. With the Stardust mission, they had this uh, aerogel capture device That's and right. and they were able to sort of capture these particles. Uh, and uh, I was recently, we recently did a podcast on that and you look at the pictures and it's just amazing. It sort of looks like it's catching bullets sort of sideways in this gel as you're seeing all these little particles that are embedding themselves. But you've got this sail out front. So how are you able to actually capture the particles with that sail in front? So the, the cool thing about our mission is that we're able to do uh, really fine maneuvers, these really agile maneuvers, because we're, we are such a small spacecraft, um, which is really good, because if we really wanted to slow down or turn around really fast and do kind of like a, a I don't know, a kickflip or like a, uh, like a drag race type scenario uh, where you drift and, and catch the backside of the sail, um, that would be completely fine, because we're only using one side of the sail for our control algorithms. So one side of the sail could be for capturing material, and the other side could be for um, actually making sure that we are capable of sailing. I see. So, so you would you'd be you'd come in to the tail, and then just at the last minute, you'd flip the sail over, and then you'd capture the particles on the backside, and then mm -hmm. flip back around and use it for for propulsion. Um, that's cool. Now, now, but were you sending all of these spacecraft towards one target? Because you know, or are know. you sending them at a whole bunch of different targets? That's a good question. I don't know if we would need to do that. The redundancy for it is a little bit much, especially if they get there and then it's, it's crowded, you know, uh, turns into Times Square. Uh, uh, of solar sails. That would be actually a cool picture. Yeah, I like it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it'd be like a bunch of selfies. I don't know. Well, they could take selfies uh, of each other anyway. You know, people always ask, like, why can't we get pictures of? Yeah. yeah, that would be really amazing, wouldn't it? That any one of those spacecraft could could take images of the other ones, and you'd have this sort of armada together. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if we would send a lot of them to the same one. There, there, there's some limiting number uh, that you would have to account for. Uh, I think there should be some redundancy. Um, two to two teams of two to five makes somewhat sense. Um, and they would also help with the co-localization. Um, it's kind of like refining the air. Right. And, and you know, that's comets, but you're also proposing visiting near-Earth objects, various mm -hmm. kinds of asteroids as well. Yeah. To date, there's been uh, most of the uh, pictures of, of asteroids and, and comets and celestial bodies that we have are from observatories, like a, a lot of them. And to be fair, uh, there are just a lot of pictures being taken continuously from a lot of observatories, but uh, only about a thousand of those are somewhere near us and within the range of size that we want. Um, we want them a certain size so that way uh, it's like gravitational issues as well as um, uh, viewpoint uh, angle issues. So we want to be able to view them from a certain altitude and catch enough of the material. I'm not material. Um, the asteroid. Um, and of those, only about 10, give or take, have actually been visited or done a flyby uh, up close. So it would be very valuable to get up close images of any asteroids. Yeah, I can just imagine the planetary scientists right now with the small number of samples. I mean, each one of the asteroids that have been visited so far is its own special 
creature. Ryugu is different from Bennu, is different from Eros, is different from Vesta. Like they're all so weird. And each one tells a story. I don't like I don't know if you've heard the it's possible that that Bennu is a piece of uh was once covered in water, a world covered in water. And so there's like evidence that um of of a much more interesting story about the early formation of these asteroids. And so yeah, planetary scientists would love to get bits and pieces of every single asteroid or you know images up close that they can get to figure out which ones to to study further um at the least so give us an idea of like the 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 time frame like say so you you know you ride chair on or you you have a launch on say a falcon 9 you're out of geosynchronous orbit you deploy oh i don't know a thousand of these solar sails and they all just sort of unfurl their wings and they're and they're floating around a geosync and then what's the kind of time frame that it would take for them to start reaching their targets sure taking um some some liberties with the non-optimal approach we've been able to calculate that using kind of a uh, uh, it was kind of a we, we chose it specifically because uh we knew we could do the really fast maneuver and so we kind of wanted to show off with it uh but if you chose a more optimal one than that one, uh, you'd be able to get there, get out of geosynchronous orbit away from uh, those gravitational pulls, essentially, uh, or the, the large influence of it um, within like 125 days. So it's not it's not much. Um, the overall length of our simulated uh, mission was uh, something like I want to say 100 or so, 200 more, 200 less days than than the actual. Um, Osiris Rex trip out to to Bennu. Um, that is also taking into account the, the the delay that they took. The extra, I think it was eight months, and then another, I want to say six months that they took in deliberating and imaging. But still. and so, what would be the plan for communicating the information back to Earth? Sure. Well, the idea would essentially be to bring them closer. So bring them back and do either like a capture scenario where you or like a waypoint scenario where you would um, have them intercept something like the ISS, not exactly coming anywhere near it, but uh, just hovering out of way, maybe off off the axial tilt and um, essentially beaming that information down. Another idea we have that's that we're simulating and uh, working out the, the formulation for is uh, coming into low Earth orbit and doing kind of like a drag uh, drag descent. Uh, either all the way down or just dipping in and beaming back the information. Uh, with the lasers that we're using now, we could actually do that. Um, so it's potential. And, and so you wouldn't like you would you would give them the commands. They would head off towards their asteroid targets. They would do their scans, sample collect, whatever the plan is. And you wouldn't hear from them. you wouldn't know if the mission was successful until they had returned to Earth and then were able to actually communicate either to ISS or relay satellites or or whatever. Is that right? Yeah, the only way we'd actually be able to do any type of uh, follow up is by uh, keeping an eye on them. So actually keeping the image of them uh, like kind of uh, uh, trained from like an observatory. Uh, hmm. That would be the 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 way I I would imagine we'd do it. And I, I mean, I guess like small asteroids, asteroids in the couple of meter class are seen as they fly relatively close to the earth and they have a very low albedo. So to sure. think that, you know, a, a bright, shiny mirror might have a higher uh, chance of spotting farther away. Yeah. we could do some, like, not only that, but there's, if we do the teams, you could have multiple of them. So that would increase the likelihood of being able to image them. Now you don't run out of fuel. I mean, this is, this is the part that I think is kind of amazing, right? Like once they've been launched, they still have an infinite amount of propellant as long as the sun keeps shining. So what happens next? Do you think? Um, so one of the cool things about being able to use solar sails is yeah, it's, it's a propellantless um, propulsion. And from that, we can essentially uh, steer in to the orbit and fall it towards the sun or steer out and get away from the sun. Uh, from there, Essentially, it will allow us to not only do a, f a flyout mission, but a return mission. Uh, there, there's a, there's talks of keeping them uh, as station station keeping waypoints as, after they're done. Um, they're, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the 
the idea. Right. I've, I've heard that. Oh, I forget the term for that. Um, but this idea that, that in like you hover where the, where the radiation from the sun perfectly balances the, uh, the gravitational effect and you get sure. this station keeping. Like a Lagrange point, or if you, if you want to do a Lazuge curve, which is just basically around the, the Lagrange points. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and like how, how far, like with this approach, how far from the earth do you think you could get like out into the solar system? I sort of think about like the Lucy mission that's gone out to the Trojan belts. Like if it's this sort of, I don't know, it's almost like you're throwing these things out into the solar system and then they're coming back and you're collecting the data and then throwing them again. How far do you think you could get? How far could you throw them? That's a good question. Uh, I would not recommend having these go f further out than uh, like one or 1 1.2 uh, AU from, from earth. Really? Uh, just because, just because of the, um, the amount of sunlight that they get, which I don't, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know what the effects would be on their ability to keep the trajectory that we expect from them. Um, Oh, because you've potentially lost contact with them and then no, they're going to have to do the rest of their navigation on their own. Yeah. Um, I don't know for sure exactly what, what the absolute limit would be. I haven't done that calculation, yeah. but uh, definitely not into deep space. Uh, just not enough sunlight projected onto the solar sail. And uh, I mean, you could get some extra inertia as you go out there, but I don't know. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I, about what, what about exploring the inner solar system? I mean, I think that's that, where solar sails really shine is getting closer to the sun. That would be an, actually uh, a really good idea. Uh, the only downside to it is uh, you have to account for that in, making, in the making of the solar sail itself, the material. So you'd have to get a higher temperature, uh, a higher um, uh melting point uh, material for the sail itself and you have to take into account a lot of the thermodynamics that are at play there but uh, yeah i do think that in a solar system it sounds really good yeah it's kind of it's sort of an interesting trade-off where you're saying okay we're going to get more power as we get closer to the sun as we drop our orbit but we're also going to potentially melt our electronics melt the the sail. So what is like the perfect size? It, I don't know. It's, it's very similar to like sailing. Like you have to decide how big of a sail you want to put because of the amount of uh, wind that you're getting and you have too big, too much sail and you capsize because yeah. you got green. Yeah, overpowered or underpowered. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Overpowered or underpowered sail. Um, that's, that's really fascinating, but it, I don't know, like as, as you were, looking doing this research and sort of thinking about the potential what do you think is kind of like the long-term potential of of solar sails as a method of exploring the solar system either big well, or small sure um i do think that solar systems hold a lot of promise i mean uh, solar sails hold a lot of promise for uh exploration but also like when we go out and start talking about like doing stuff on the moon and uh like building networks of, of like internet space, internet or space Wi-Fi. Um, I do think that would be kind of an analogous, analogous to like the, uh, like a, like a waypoint drone or something like that. Um, that's, that's kind of like the, the, one of the, one of the ideas that's kind of being thrown out there using it as a interconnect or a networking system. Um, but I think you need to beef up, beef up the communications. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's some pretty cool new stuff that's being done by NASA using lasers for communication systems. They've been sending cat videos from Psyche at ludicrous bandwidth, and so yeah. you can Those kind of imagine, yeah, yeah, and all like it's a super high resolution cat video, and so you can kind of imagine them um, like setting up some kind of ad hoc mesh network of lasers connecting these things together. I mean, it's this idea of infrastructure that that we just don't have out there right now. And there's a ton of demand for infrastructure and having spacecraft that can do station keeping without propellant is a really exciting idea. Yeah, I think so. 
<laughs> so so yeah. what's what's next for the, you know the you know I contacted you because you had you're part of a team that uh put together a journal article in Acta Astronautica. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the next step now that you've told everybody your idea? Well, one of the next steps is to prototype it, um, which we're, we are currently doing, um, working with a great team of undergrads and other grad students uh, together with P uh, under Professor Peaster. Um, and we're really just trying to figure out how, how all, all these components are going to come together and how they're going to, live or, or manage themselves in space, uh, in space-like conditions. Very, very, uh, essentially vacuum and fluctuations in heat um, that are uh, vast and quick. Uh, that, it's coupled with the radiation itself, is a lot of, these are a lot of things that we have to tackle. And I'm really excited about the potential for uh, jumping out of Vomit Comet with one of these and seeing, seeing how it unfurls or something like that. Maybe for the first three or four uh, parabolas, and then after that, you know, you may start mm -hmm. to regret. I hear nobody gets out of these things unharmed. I don't um, know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty much a champ at uh, roller coasters. So. All right, all right, all right. Well, you know, I'm sure that's what they all say. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but so, you know, like you've got this, this, this balance where you've got this miniaturization. Like you're, you're, you're taking all of this technology, as you say, off the shelf technology. You are miniaturizing it. Um, or, you know, using the smallest possible versions of this. Do you think that like, has the small sat world battle tested these things enough to the point that you feel like there's no unknowns in, in how this stuff will perform in space? Well, there's always unknowns and there's always un unpredictables, but I also want to clarify something. We are specifically choosing low cost components. We aren't choosing the smallest of the small. We do have designs for, a. Uh, uh, a sporty configuration, kind of like the, the Ferrari of, or, or the, the Miata of uh, solar sails, uh, where it's everything's super, super lightweight, super high, high end, um, custom built, custom designed, uh, custom manufactured, photolithography and just everything. Um, so the current, the current model is, is kind of your, uh, your hatchback or your, uh, your, custom, your, your, your Volkswagen, uh, and we are looking forward to a Ferrari model. That, right. that would be awesome. And is that because they're more durable? Like these these large, I mean, they're cheaper probably, but they're also, they're just, they've spent more time in space in general? Well, a lot of the systems that, that we are pulling out from off the shelf have actually been tested in space. A few haven't, which is something that we have to go ahead and do ourselves now. Um, as well, they've they've been radiation tested. They've uh, they've been checked for her radiation hardness and and latchups and what what have you. Um, they've endured the the range of the temperature and pressure, and uh, been characterized for their outgassing and the, and the electronics components. Um, they've uh, yeah they've been uh, vibration checked and uh, drop checked. So we're kind of like uh, we're kind of like leaning on the expertise that has already been done ahead of us in hoping for, for the best, not hoping for the best in planning for the best in these, in these solar sales that are uh, like a really cheap option. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but the, these are meant to cost on the order of a thousand dollars each that compared to the, the hundreds of millions that uh, Osiris Rex took. Um, yeah. And that's actually the size of two weeks size and weight about of two V, uh, Volkswagen VWs uh, stacked on top of each other. So. so, so you, you know, you work with your, with your team, you develop a prototype. What's the next, and you've tested, you know, you've tested it in various vacuum chambers and heat chambers and, and vibration testing and all of that. What is the next kind of test that you'd want to do? Sure. Um, we want to do some uh, station keeping first, uh, coupled with uh, maybe split, split the task between teams of them. Um, we have, we have to obviously make sure that the unfurling is, is going to work. We have to make sure that the, um, orientation correction, uh, the high speed orientation correction, uh, is, is going to be, uh, viable in, in, uh, microgravity. And then the next step would be, uh, to, to beam down messages from, uh, low earth orbit. Uh, from there, the next, next test would obviously be trying to get out 
to uh, the um, out of, out from the Earth's uh, gravitational pull, uh, basically do an Earth escape, and hopefully not too far off from that. I don't know how many it would take, uh, how many uh, proofs proofs of concept from there or steps from there, but we would like to get some to some comments. Um, I don't know if that's uh, in the next five years. I don't know if that's in the next decade, but it, it would great be great to see it before I, you know. But, the, uh, yeah. but when I think about sort of like the minimum viable spacecraft, you know, like, would you be able to fit within a, one of those small CubeSat sizes yeah. and, and ride share with some other mission? Yeah, actually, um, the way that these, uh, the current, even the current, uh, low cost model, um, the solar cell itself isn't meant to stay that size. The carbon fiber tubes that we use to reinforce it are actually quite bendable and foldable. And so you could, if you think about your, your windshield cover, those, those reflectors that you, that you buy off the car wash, um, how they fold, it's kind of the same concept. And so we would just manufacture them and uh, pre-fold them into maybe uh, folds of three, maybe even up to five, uh, depending on how, what the radius of, of the, of the curvature is, is pre-bent. And then, from there, you could absolutely take a step forward and, and talk about this new super small Ferrari version, high, high custom end that you could stuff inside of a CubeSat. That would be absolutely viable. Right. Yeah. Uh, so if NASA's listening and wants to try this out, uh, you guys are ready. Yes. Um, uh, fantastic. So, uh, Alexander, what are you obsessed with right now? <laughs> uh, what am I obsessed with? Um, graduating. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. we talked before, you were talking about like, you know, how small can we make a robot? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. So some of the designs that we're working with, some of the robots that we're, we are working with are uh, size of like a penny, um, and, and smaller. And what we're doing is we're trying to make these robust micro machines, these micro robots that are insect like, or, um, in other cases, just robot like. And what we ha want to have them do is go around and sensing what the, what's around them and what they're climbing on. Uh, one of the, the dreams is to have them just crawl around on our desk as little as little uh, message senders uh, to each to each other at least at first, and then uh, from there we want to be able to take these and load them onto some of these spacecraft, onto some of these uh, solar sails, drop them off on, a, on an asteroid and keep track of that asteroid and maybe even bring back some, some material. Um, asteroidal material is a little different. Um, it's not as fine and it's not usually as, uh, as easy to, to apprehend. So I don't know what, how much a, a micro robot would be able to carry, but it'd be fun to see. Yeah. 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 I, I like this idea though, of these like little, little tiny robots just crawling around on this landscape, examining everything they, they see. Um, I mean, just, I mean, I think that is such a big revolution that we've gone through now, this miniaturization. And, and yet, I mean, obviously we have lots and lots of CubeSats and we're seeing some really exciting new tests, but still most of these flagship missions are, as you said, the size of trucks. They're not tiny little robots. And then every now and then you get these really cool tests. The Japanese have done this with some of their missions where they just start throwing all kinds of robots at, at a destination to see what works and what doesn't work. And it feels like there's a lot more innovation that's required. Uh, yeah. well, Alexander, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today and, and good luck, uh, with awesome. your, with your upcoming, uh, flight with your millions. Of, yeah. of solar sails swarming across the solar system. I look forward to it. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Alexander Alvara. I'm going to talk more about swarms of spacecraft in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Stephen filler Munley, Paul Rohrbach, Abe Kingston, Hey Twilight, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, and Tony Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplin, Monzo, George, David Gilton, and Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us, the master of the universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. As I mentioned in the introduction, I'm really excited about the idea of low-cost spacecraft. I'm really excited about the idea of solar sails. 
And I really like this idea of redundancy. And this mission sort of brings it all together that you're using off the shelf components, you're building relatively small redundant spacecraft, yet they're using solar sails, which are this propellantless method that would allow you to travel in space for as long as your spacecraft can survive. And by sending, say, a thousand off to many different targets, you're going to learn a ton about how these kinds of spacecraft perform in space, what are the real sizes, what kinds of targets make a lot of sense. And we can gather so much scientific information about a lot of these different objects and just fill in a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that we're missing about the early history of the solar system, about the threat from near Earth objects. There's a ton of good reasons to build this kind of a spacecraft. So I really hope this works and I can't wait to see what happens next. Now, I have done a lot of those interviews about sending big solar sails, small solar sails to other star systems using lasers. So I'm going to link you to a couple of those interviews now. Thanks. We'll see you next time.